We really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. I'm Lynn Snodgrass, the CEO of the Gresham Chamber of Commerce, the best darn chamber in the whole Pacific Northwest. And today we are really honored with um, somebody that has quite a bit of ink and digital power in our area. So I'm looking. Is that you already, Warner? <laughs> It wasn't you this time. Bob, are you owning it up? Okay, Bob's owning it. <laughs> okay, so if you've come to these before, you don't warn her. It's usually the one that reminds us to turn our phones off because his phone rings during the announcements. So I would like to take the time to thank the folks that make today possible. And the first one would be our presenting sponsor. Dean Funk is here. Dean Funk, you work for a very amazing company, Portland General Electric. Thank you so much. And Portland General Electric is our presenting sponsor. You can applaud Dean. He's doing a great job for them. Our stakeholder sponsor is the Gresham Barlow School District. And Dr. Pereira is here with us today. Doctor, thank you very much for being here. Metro East Community Media makes us permanent on the airwaves. Thank you, Keith, for being here. And there's a replay schedule on the desk outside. On your way out, you can pick up a replay schedule so that you can hear again what you thought you heard before. And I'd also like to, rela to recognize any elected officials that we have here. Councillor Eccles is here, and Councillor Hinton is here, right? Taking a mouthful of food. Thank you both for your service to our community. We appreciate you. And I need to let you know that four of my bosses are here. Dean Funk, Portland General Electric, is a board member. Dr. Lisa Scari from Matthew Community College is a board member. Warner Allen, the phone gink, uh, Warner Allen, uh, Warren Allen LLC, and Counselor Carolyn Eccles is also a board member for the chamber board. Um, something happened this weekend that I would like to share with you. I bring up stories about the bear that came to my back door that is harassing our chickens, and I tell you every once in a while little things about my husband that <clears throat> none of us will share outside of this room, and then I have grandchildren's stories, and I have one for you today. Over the weekend, we had Drake's family come over for Christmas. Drake's family is big. We had 63 people there at the house. Not all of them were there. But I thought it would be fun to invite Santa to come, and so Santa did. Santa came and spent an hour with us, and my youngest grandson, Paxton, was in awe of Santa, in awe. He didn't harass him. He didn't goo gaga over him. He just was very respectful. He sat on his lap. Santa said, what would you like for Christmas? And he told him. And then he left, and he would sit in the back, and he'd keep looking at Santa and this, this awe look. And one more time, within the hour, he reminded Santa of what he wanted for Christmas. And Santa was getting ready to leave, so I was standing by Santa Steve as he was getting ready to leave, and here comes my grandson running up to him again, saying, thank you, Santa, so much for bringing me a... And then he told Santa, and again, what he wanted. And Santa reminded him, now you need to get a picture and tell your parents what you want, because everything has to be OK with them, too. OK, OK, I will. Well, I called my daughter, because what I had observed was a very important thing that my daughter needed to see. This grandson said the same thing three times and was convinced that Santa was going to bring it to him. So I called her and told her about that. And I said, but I don't know what it was. I couldn't understand what he was saying. So you need to find out. And if I can help out, I will. So she emailed me. She said, he wants a pug dog and an Xbox, neither of which he's going to get. <laughs> And I said, well, that's a problem. And she says, we can't have dogs. And we have decided as a family that we're not going to have Xbox. OK, I, I get that. But does that mean grandma can't do it? Or you know, there's all that grandma thing. So the next thing I get was this as a text message. Dear Santa, my mom says I can't have a puppy or an Xbox. I guess I'll just get a Lego set. <laughs> well, 
Well, needless to say, I emailed my daughter right away and I said, if I were you, I'd buy him a puppy and every Xbox in the world after that letter. And she said, yeah, Eric and I, her husband and I, are considering doing just that. Well, the reason I want to share that story with you is because that's a business story. How many times have you put your faith in something, you know it's going to work, you've asked for it, you've worked hard for it, you've done everything including thanking everybody to help make it happen, and then it doesn't happen. So what do you do? You ship gears. Okay, what he said is, I guess I'll just get a Lego set. A Lego set is still very expensive and a very high-tech thing. So he hasn't changed necessarily a big thing, just like you don't change when you change your business plan a little bit to something radical. You just shift. You pivot. You do something. And you put your faith in something else, and then you surround yourself with people that are going to make it happen. Grandma saw that. How many Lego sets do you think I bought yesterday? <laughs> Our business, our business changes are the same. Well, there's one industry that we have among us that has pivoted majorly, and that's the media industry. And that's why I'm so fortunate and so glad that our guest speaker is going to be with us today. I'm not going to introduce him, however. The chairman of the Government Affairs Council is going to. Brian Lessler, PDG Construction Services, would you come on up and introduce our speaker? I'm going to oh, stay right you're here. You're going to stay right there. I'm going to stay right here. <clears throat> it's now four minutes afternoon, so good afternoon. It's nice to have you all here. You know, these days we just assume that you can jump on our computers and find out pretty much anything you want about anything in the world, right? Um, everything's on Google or Bing or Yahoo, right? In fact, Google knows more about you than your mother does. And that's the truth. When you want to find out about someone uh, that has deep roots in your community, um, the same job at the same company for over a decade, uh, and in the media industry, you would think that the information would be overflowing. Uh, but that was not the case when we started to put together some notes uh, for today's guest speaker. So when we Googled Craig, this is what we might know about Craig Wessel. Uh, he's the author of game books like uh, Parent's Guide to Nintendo Games, uh, Earthworm Jim 3D Official Strategy Guide, Super Mario Advanced Guide, and at least two dozen other uh, similar uh, books. Um, another fascinating fact you might know about Craig Wessel is that he scored no points in a 1985 basketball game between Wake Forest and Duke. Unfortunately, Wake Forest lost, and that was the team that Craig Wessel was on. <clears throat> he also plays the guitar, not exactly Jimi Hendrix or anything, but <laughs> Apparently, he plays the guitar. But you know, I'm not sure that those Greg Wessels are actually the one that we're talking about. Not our Greg Wessel, anyhow. What I do know for sure about our speaker today is this. His name is Greg Wessel. He is the publisher of the Portland Business Journal, and he has been with the company since 2008. He's a Portland resident. And according to um, the official Portland Business Journal website, he has at least 24 employees. You know, Craig must be a very private person uh, who writes about everyone else um, and makes an effort to stay out of the headlines, uh, which limits Google's access to him. The other thing I know for sure is that he's going to be very entertaining and um, will be enlightened by Craig today. Our format's going to be slightly different. Uh, you'll still get to ask questions at the end, toward the end, but Lynn's going to start us off today uh, by actually doing an interview with Craig. So please welcome the real Craig Wessel. Thank you. Did you play basketball? Was that you? No, but 
<laughs> if I did, zero points would have been. <laughs> so part of it was accurate. All right, and, so. I also don't write um, the game books. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Craig West looks. Well, I, it's too bad because he has a lot of them. There'd be a lot of money involved in yeah. that one. Yeah. Yeah, there would be. And it's spelled the same. Never too late. Right? Never too late. So, yeah. Never too late. So I, as many of you may, get. Um, the PBJ, the Portland Business Journal, information all the time. I get a letter, I get the latest from publisher Craig, I get a morning edition, an afternoon edition, it comes in my mailbox, it's on the news all the time, and it always has bombshell kinds of headlines. And when I say bombshell, I don't mean negative things necessarily, but it's, I'll buy the Apple Watch because I'm human, was a headline. Exclusive, makes you wanna open it. Breaking up the boys club, which boys club? First look, why Phil King did, you know, fill in the blank over and over and over again. So that's important because that helps us want to click um, and go on. But the media presence um, has had a strong presence and PBJ has had one and is well respected still among the business community. So how have you adapted to the current environment? of the anti-print, the anti-news, um, all that in order to maintain that level of respect. Yeah. Uh, so just to clarify, I actually came back to Portland um, 18 years ago in 2001 as publisher of the Business Journal. Um, so uh, it was, um, and, and I think there's a number of things that, that transpired over that time, uh, most of which uh, has happened since the recession that have allowed us to, um, to really um, uh, play at a level that we had not been able to uh, in the past. And I, and I will uh, say this year is looking like it's going to be the best year for the Portland Business Journal in the history of the paper. And, that, and so I was here in 1984 uh, for the launch of the, the Portland Business Journal. I was on a startup team, um, but was here for just a short period of time. Uh, but but that that path to the best year in the in the history of the paper this year has has come with a lot of uh, a lot of challenges to it. So uh, when I got back to to Portland in um, 2001. Uh, you know, we were very, the Portland Business Journal, went, and so we're part of a, a chain of uh, 40 business journals around the country, and then we also have three markets that are uh, digital only, right? And so when I refer to we, I refer to the, the Portland Business Journal, right? We are very, run very autonomously uh, from the rest of the, the publications. But when I came back to Portland um, in 2001, we, you know, had the weekly uh, print publication and we were putting on uh, a few events, maybe three events or so. And uh, one of the things that uh, became abundantly clear uh, right away was that it, it was, um, Business was not celebrated a lot in this uh, in this city, and pr particularly in the in uh, the Portland core, um, and that presented an opportunity uh, to start building our events business. And so, what what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do, was to act as convener, uh, was to celebrate the things that business brings back to uh, the city and state. Um, and to facilitate relationships, and so we started uh, we started adding uh, programs and and a lot of awards programs and also a lot of content programs. But the awards programs, in particular, we we did that to to try and to really celebrate you know what businesses and and business people were accomplishing, and so. Um, we've grown that now to, uh, we're, we're putting on anywhere between 40 and 45 events a year now. But one of the things that that did leading up to the recession was to really build, uh, help build our brand. You know, it was, uh, it was a really, it was a really key uh, piece for us of, of engaging with the community and bringing our customers closer uh, to the newspaper. So. Um, we, had, we, we as a company, as American City Business Journals, had, had sort of started down the digital road uh, prior to the recession, um, but really kind of sticking our, our toes in the water of trying different things and so forth. And we were, you know, we had, uh, we had some newsletters out, but they were very, they were relatively small. Um, but 
one of the things that we did around 2006, 2007 was create a standalone technology division at our corporate headquarters. And so, so as you know, as as we look at what's transpired with um, a lot of the general interest publications, the dailies, and so forth, and magazines, um, there were a lot of things that that they had. Um, uh, that were going against them. And, and one, and most importantly, was all of the dailies across the country had uh, become wholly dependent on uh, newswire uh, uh, content, right? And so, um, uh, so there was that and there was uh, the classifieds. Right, and and so this was this was true of any daily. They were they were really dependent on uh, the content from the newswire and the classifieds. And the two things that the internet completely disrupted were, you know, uh, the newswires and the and the uh, the classifieds. The newswire, all of a sudden, you could get that information 24/7 uh, in a hundred different channels online on the internet. Um, classifieds, uh, cheaper, faster, better, right, than uh, on the internet. The things that, that they, they also, you know, when Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal, uh, he referred to dailies as uh, apathy born of monopoly. And, I think, and I, I think that was a really accurate description of a lot of the dailies in this country. And so what, what that, the scenario that created for them was they did not have the brand that they should have had to carry on to, to carry into the digital sphere, right? What we had going for us was we were solely focused on local uh, business news. Mm -hmm. That was our purpose. And, and for the Portland Business Journal, our mission has been and still is about covering growth and business growth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we were able, between the, you know, starting that technology division at our corporate headquarters gave us the ability to, um, to play in the in the digital world at a level we never would have had had we not done that or had we been a standalone entity. Uh, so was it a timing issue? You just happened to hit it at the right time? Because there's a lot of them are changing now, but. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, I think the time, I'm not sure we hit it at the right time. You know, we struggled for a while, right? We struggled for a while. And, and but I, I think the, I think more importantly was our ability to, uh, to leverage um, the relationship that we had with our customers over to that new platform. Mm -hmm. right? So you built, brand, you built brand by having the awards. You right. created an atmosphere where businesses could be acknowledged for things that they were doing, um, linked to your brand, obviously. But then there's this thing called Power breakfast. What? Why do that? I mean, that sounds like a whole lot of work. Getting speakers is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Having convincing them to come is not easy. No, I'm teasing. You yeah. were very easy to convince. But but when you set yourself up for a power breakfast once a month with big time people, how did that work in, or how does that work into the business journal? Maybe you could explain what the power breakfasts are. Oh, sure, sure. So just just to sort of complete that, you know. So so right now, you know. 2001, we had a weekly newspaper and uh, and three events. Right now, we still have the weekly newspaper. It's still growing. We've grown circulation 13 out of the last 15 years uh, for the print or the digital version of the print mm -hmm. product. We've got five digital newsletters. We're doing 3 million page views a month uh, on our website, 300,000 unique visitors, about 65, 70% of those coming from the four county area. Um, wow. We've got, uh, we've grown the audience tenfold in the last six years or so, we've got, you know, the digital newsletters run from 8,000 subscribers up to 20,000 subscribers, and then 45 events. And we're doing that with um, 12 fewer people than we had um, back then. And that's, you know, that's what technology does for you, right? So, um, so uh, the Power Breakfasts were, uh, the, the, pub the uh, publisher I replaced 20, 19 years ago, uh, Mike Consul, had, had started this just before I came, I came back. And he was doing it with a, in a partnership with KXL Radio, uh, where he, had, he would, had invited some CEOs uh, to come and uh, do a onstage, a live onstage interview. And I really liked the concept, and so I kept doing it. And so, um, you know, 19 years later, um, I've done uh, about 210 monthly interviews with uh, with um, CEOs, and and they are uh, they're they're more about. Um, 
getting to understand the sort of strategies, philosophies, uh, and personalities behind these individuals than it is having somebody come in and just sort of talk at you about uh, about business. And it's been uh, it's been the best part of my job. It's a lot of work, and you're right, getting getting uh, speakers is a lot of work. Preparing for those things is a lot of work, but it, it has been by far. Uh, I just absolutely love doing them still. So, do you have a favorite and a nightmare? <laughs> Uh, I, ha I have I have several favorites, and and um, you know uh, uh, Bob Moore at, at Bob's Red Mill uh, was a great great one. article this week about yeah, him. By the way, uh, he is he's he's one of a kind, and. Um, uh, you know, Ann Mulcahy, uh, the chairwoman for uh, Xerox, uh, I, I bugged her for three years and she finally came out and she was just, um, she was just amazing. And has, she was running HR when Xerox was about to go bankrupt and uh, they tagged her to, to become yeah. CEO of the company. It was an amazing story. Uh, Jim Senegal, the founder of Costco, uh, another just, um, he, it was like, um, He's, he's probably one of my absolute favorites. He w it was like just talking to my grandfather on stage, and, and he had such a clear, um, and this was right in the middle of the recession. This was in 2009 that, I, that, uh, that Jim was there. And he had just such a clear uh, picture of what was wrong and what was right. And this is a public company, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he did not care what happened to the stock market. I mean, obviously he cared, but well, yeah. the moves that he made, the opportunities that he passed up because they were, they did not fall within his sort of moral compass uh, were astounding. Mm -hmm. And, and so he, so he was, uh, he was great. We had, um, uh, you know, and one of the stories Anne Mulcahy told, I, I, I just carry it with me all the time. She talked about, she grew up on a farm and so, so when she was uh, when she was trying to write the 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 ship with this with this massive company, um, she said she always went back to this saying that her that her dad uh, told her, which was, um, you know, when the cow's in the ditch. You don't you don't try and figure out who to blame. You know you get the cow out of the ditch, and then you figure out why the why the cow got, got in, the, in ditch, the ditch, and then you figure out how to stop the cow from ever getting in the ditch again. You fill right? up the hole. And uh, <laughs> and so so he so she was you know she was she was terrific. Um, uh, there have been some just hilarious individuals. Peter Jacobson. Um, uh, was hysterical. You're avoiding the nightmare ones. Yeah. So uh, the night. So there's a couple of versions of the nightmare ones. You know, um, uh, one would be uh, Mike Rich, who built Bandon Dunes, uh, and who also founded American Greeting Cards Company. Just this incredible, incredible background. And I was just so excited to have him uh, as a Power Breakfast guest. And um, I don't typically talk to the Power Breakfast guests before we before we get there. And we had uh, for Mike's uh, Power Breakfast, there was uh, I think about 500 people in that in that audience. And and uh, so I was walking over. You know, they start at 7:30. I was walking over to the Governor Hotel and ran into Mike at the Starbucks in Pioneer Square. And so we were walking over to the hotel together. And I'm kind of asking him some questions, you know, and and because again, I, I don't, I do not like to talk to the mm -hmm. to the folks before we get up on stage, because, and uh, and he starts telling me these stories, and I'm walking over, going, thinking, oh man, this is going to be great, this is going to be the best ever, and we get up, you know, we get to the to the hotel, and he goes, you know. Um, I got to tell you, I get really nervous in front of people. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, Mike, it's just a conversation. You know, we're just, we just have a conversation. So I will typically, you know, have a sheet or prepare like 40 to 50 questions. And I don't follow the sheet, but it's, but it's just helpful to, to sort of, you know, to keep them going. And it's just, typically it's just a conversation. So I, I get up there and, and, and like I said, there's 500 people and Mike gets up there and, and he immediately starts sweating. You know, and I'm I'm going oh, okay, <laughs> you know, and so I'll ask him a I ask him a question. It's yes, I'll ask him a question. No, and you know things like so. I, so I understand. You know, you 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 have a lot of philanthropy in your background. You really enjoy you know giving to to education. Yeah, <laughs> and I 
you know, in in uh, 25 minutes, I was through, you know, All almost questions. the entire list, <laughs> and and he sort of, you know, he loosened up a little bit at the end, but um, but it he was, but it's um, it was really interesting because here's this guy who has accomplished just so much, you know, this incredible individual, and um, and the one th and the one thing that just you know terrified him was being in front of a front of an audience and then so there were you know there were other you know there were other people by and large um, I, I've been shocked and and just really amazed at how consistently um, kind um, thoughtful humorous self-deprecating that these CEOs have been and these are all people who are at, at those levels you know um, and but with few exceptions and and the exceptions are maybe you know on I could count on one hand over over um, you know uh, 200 and some guests, and, and one we had the vice chairman of the uh, New York Stock Exchange on, and I just, it was, uh, I, you know, I had my hand in my wallet the entire time we were there, but uh, um, that was a long time ago. I can't remember his name. So, uh, but there have been, you know, there have been very few uh, nightmares, although you do find out a lot about yourself on that. I had uh, Governor Kulingoski, and I, so I had all the governors. Uh, on Power Breakfast, and this one, and Governor Kulikowski was early on. It was when we were doing it at the Benson Hotel, and on the on the stage to the left of the Benson Hotel, there's this sort of curtained off little area, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, prior to the breakfast starting, uh, the governor's security task force comes in, right? And they're just they're looking at all around, and they're you know peeking behind stuff, and you know it kind of makes you nervous, right? You're just kind of going, oh, this is this is a real deal, and so I'm sitting here, and the and the governor's sitting to my right, and we're talking, and I start hearing this rustling over in the room behind the behind the curtain, you know, and I and I see the governor starting to look over there a lot, you know, and so I'm starting to look over there and, and the governor's, you know, the governor's kind of trying to get the attention of his, of his mm -hmm. security guy and I, and I realize that, you know, I'm, I'm right in the line of fire, <laughs> you know, and I, and I kind of find myself doing this, you know, so not my proudest moment, but anyway, they, um, those, uh, those interviews have been, I have learned so much from, from uh, so many great people there and and they've been they've been just a really um, incredible part of uh, of my career. So well, you've been very lucky to be able to do that. We're going to sh switch gears a little bit. So when I looked at the website in preparation for the introduction, I looked at the PBJ website and looked at who your reporters are, who your employees are, and what they do. You have one reporter that entirely uh, covers healthcare. You have one reporter that covers real estate. You have one reporter that covers technology, startups, and entrepreneurs. But this one I find interesting, and Dean, maybe you will too. You have one reporter that works on energy, cannabis, and wine. Now, what those three things have to do with each other, it, maybe it's typecasting for whoever the reporter is, but that's the segue into economic development, yeah. okay? Yeah. So um, I thought it was a fun segue into economic development, personally. So what are some examples of issues that will help the metro area sustain solid economic growth, in your opinion? So are there, are, is there one in particular thing that's going to maintain economic growth in the whole area, or is it full of stumbling blocks or speed bumps? So. Um, I think we are still, um, uh, you know, we're still a small business market, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and as such, I think you you tend to be at the uh, at the whipsaw of, of economic conditions, right? The one the one thing that has changed um, in really just the past probably seven years, seven or eight years. Uh, that I think has completely changed the economic dynamics of, of this of uh, the Portland region in particular uh, has been um, the amount of capital that's starting to flow into uh, that's starting to flow in this region, and you know for for the first uh, you know. 
10, 11 years uh, that I had come back, it, there was this sort of constant bemoaning of the fact that we did not, not only did we not have access to, to venture capital or private equity capital in uh, in Portland, which was true. I mean, we had a you know, we had a couple of small, small venture capital firms, and I, and, and I think Endeavor Capital was the Something only private name, equity we had. Nameless. Yeah, Quite right. Time. Well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but. But what would happen is the money would come in from the Silicon Valley or from Boston or from one of the other financial centers, and the next thing you knew, that that business was going, uh, was moving their headquarters elsewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. So what we've seen in the last six or seven years is, and my God, this year was unbelievable. I mean, it broke all records, right, for for uh, uh, for private equity investment, and venture capital investment. The money's staying here, right? They're investing in Portland businesses and. Um, and they're leaving them here, and even to the extent of you know uh, Amazon's investment in in Elemental, uh, AWS Elemental, uh, and we just weren't seeing that before. Mm -hmm. And 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 Sam Blackman with Elemental, um, uh, who died just very suddenly, was a huge loss to this uh, to this community because he was one of the pioneers around trying to uh, trying to create uh, trying to make Portland a technology hub, mm -hmm. you know. And, and he and several others, Luke Kinesi, Puppet, and so forth. Puppet got, what, um, $100 million or something, $50 million. JAMA just got $200 million this year. So, um, so to see those dollars coming in like that is, uh, is I think, um, uh, is a really positive, uh, really positive de development. Now, you know it, what happens in the next recession. You know, we've also got a lot of uh, a lot of companies, Google, Facebook, that have a, a significant presence here, uh, that aren't headquartered here. You know, I think one of the one of the challenges with not being a headquarter town is um, what happens with those outposts. You know, when when times get really difficult, and so yeah, more vulnerable at yeah, that point. Yeah, for sure. Time. They for are. Sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When you define Portland, do you when you think about Portland and you referred to Portland several times, do you include Gresham and Hillsboro in that Portland, or do you just think Portland core little surrounding area? What's your no? What's your I, I think about the region, right? Okay. Although. Um, uh, although it's easy, you know, for us as a as a as a business news organization, uh, you know, the economic engine is clearly uh, in the in the in the closer into core. the downtown mm -hmm. core. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, our coverage is the four county area, including Southwest Washington. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm going to switch gears again. Um, we're, I want to talk about homelessness just real briefly because I know you've got the answer to it. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. clearly. You, you're going to fix it on your way out to the car. But um, but I'm, we, we talk about homelessness. We talk about housing that's affordable. We talk about affordable housing. And now we have a Speaker of the House. And at the time that I um, asked you to come, I didn't know that she was proposing for us to become the first state in the nation to not allow single family home permits for any s jurisdiction over 10,000 people. I don't know if you know that, but that is one of her main driving forces, which may be linked to affordable housing and homelessness. I mean, there's there's several bubbles that kind of coincide there. So can you fix it for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I had it in my head um, prior to this last election that um, that somehow Portland, uh, in Portland in particular, had, had shifted towards the middle. Uh, and then the election happened. Could you define middle? <laughs> yeah, well, the middle's to the left, yeah. for sure. Uh, but that was, uh, I don't know where I had that information or that thought, but that was clearly not the case after this last election. So, so look, I, I, I do think that having been here in the late 70s, the mid 80s, and then again for the past, for the past 18 years, I, nobody can convince me that this isn't the best version of Portland, and I mean the general area that we've ever had. That said, you know, that, that type of growth comes with a lot of problems and um, but but what I think is uh, what I think is unique about um, about our issues with homelessness is um, 
is the dialogue needs to change about it. You know, it, there's there's homelessness, and and I'm and I'm this, now I'm talking particularly because this is my experience. I live in downtown Portland. I work in downtown Portland, so most of my exposure to that issue is downtown Portland. There's homelessness and we there's We have a realtor here that could sell you a house yeah. in Persimmon real quick. <laughs> okay. That's beautiful out here. That, yeah. that drive on, that Butler know, Drive is just gorgeous. Go ahead, sorry. So there's homelessness and there's lawlessness. And, and you know, the two, get, the two get just thrown together and talked about as if they're one and the same. And I am, I am really proud to be part of a business community that is, that is really investing a lot of thought and a lot of resources um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of other capital into trying to increase uh, housing for the homeless, right? Affordable housing for the homeless. Um, and and I, I think the, I think the, the con there there's, gets to be a lot of confusion around what people are complaining about. And they're not, com I, by and large, I don't think anybody that I've ever run into has had any problem with helping to support initiatives that help the homeless. What they don't like uh, is, uh, is the rampant lawlessness in, in downtown Portland. That, and, you know, I, uh, I was on the uh, Portland Business Alliance board uh, for quite a while, and, and Daniel Outlaw, the new chief of police, came in and sort of talked about it in terms of, well, we can arrest them, we can take them to the jail, there's no room in the jail. If they actually get into the jail, um, they get some services while they're there. They don't get any services, they get let out and they go right back onto the streets. Right? So I don't know what the solution to that piece is, but I do know... A ticket to Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's... Uh, Could you take that off of the video, please? <laughs> yeah. That was a joke prior to I saying it, and after I said it, there we go. But, and, and you know, uh, Tim Boyle just got skewered for his, yeah. for his opinion piece, which I thought was just, the, him getting skewered was just ridiculous. So this is exactly what he was talking about. You know, I think we're so afraid to, to, uh, to hold people accountable because it looks like we're coming down on the homelessness. Well, you know, um, a, a, being a, a drug addict is not justification for, for breaking the law. Being homeless is not justification for breaking the law. We have a huge mental health issue. That is a huge piece of this. Um, you know, uh, we had the the four competing health organizations and uh, um, Legacy, um, Kaiser, Kaiser Providence, OHSU, and Samaritan, I believe, came together to put uh, the Unity Center together, which is just an in, an incredible achievement, right? To to focus on on this problem and. Um, and they were trying to do it in a very innovative way, and ran into some ran into some serious, you know, issues and some stumbles, and and the the outrage around that was just um, I, I was it, it was just amazing, you know, that that uh, they're they're trying to they're trying to address this issue, and and then they just get they just get absolutely pounded on about that, and I think they're that's they're going to come out of it, but. Um, Instead of trying to support them, you know, they were every everybody wanted to just tear them down. That was just the saddest thing. But so anyway, uh, I don't I don't have any answers to to homelessness. Obviously, I do appreciate how you've treated the homelessness. Though a lot of us put all the homeless in one pot, and that's not true. There's mental illness. There's between paychecks. There's people that choose to be homeless because they want to be lawless, and the, the, the alcohol, the uh, the drug addicted. Yeah. So appreciate that. All right, so. I don't know why, but Dean told me, yeah, that I needed to ask you a question about guitars. Do you own them? Do you play them? Are you serious? There wasn't anything in Google about you and a guitar. Yeah. I just know from a little fly on the wall that you do this. Yeah. So is that an artsy fartsy thing that you do? Is it, <laughs> you know, what is it? I suppose. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't. Uh, spend any time uh, at all on social media. I've, I've, you know, I've tried. I've gone down that path a few times over over the years, and um, 
We're right. talking about guitars. I know. I'll get to that. But I find it very unrewarding. You know. And so anyway. So yeah. There's not a lot. Of, yes. I I have a I have uh, had a forty some year love affair with guitars and it and is still ongoing. Do you have a collection? What is it? What's I, the? I don't consider it a collection. I have a lot of guitars. <laughs> How many is but a they, lot? They all get played. Uh, you know. I don't know. Like I, five? No. Ten? No. Twenty? Uh, yeah. A room full? Probably, yeah. Probably I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I probably. Do you have probably one in the trunk of your in the car? 20. <laughs> I do. No, you never put a guitar in the trunk here. Okay, okay, so I don't know. I, yeah. I don't have. So, do you play the guitar? No, I just collect. No, you just yes. collect yes, them. Yes, of course I do. Yes. You yes, and Blake on the Voice, I, you collect yeah. guitars. <laughs> no, I played. Uh, I played for for um, a long time. Professionally? Uh, I did uh, depend. Uh, you know, define professionally, but uh, yes, I played. That would be uh, getting paid for. Yeah. So I played. Uh, through college, and then after I got out of college, I played uh, weekends in, in clubs for years and years, and then I actually left um, publishing to, I just got, was just sort of uh, burnt out and, and went down and spent a year at uh, the Grove School of Music in Los Angeles and studied uh, for a year and then was sort of, had one foot in the music business and one foot in publishing consulting for, for several years. And, um, and uh, yeah. So. Shelly, what's our music budget for the Business Excellence Awards? <laughs> There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's going to cost you. Okay. Yeah. The, Careful what you ask. Wednesday, for, by the way. January sixteenth. Okay. That, that'd be really fun. It could be our own little power luncheon. We could have you play for us. And Dean's offered to sing, so we'll. Excellent. Okay, yeah. then I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What put? What? Why did you hang up the guitar? Why? If, if it's a passion and a love, and yep. you were educated, why did you switch? Um, yeah, uh, that is that is probably um, uh, the only regret I have, and you know, I didn't hang up the guitar. I still I have a little music studio in my home. Uh, I play every day, um, but uh, I did leave uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I was on a. Uh, consulting job up in Minnesota. I was consulting with three publications up there at the time and and had had you know had really just started to to get underway in, in LA with you know pursuing as a songwriter and that's what I was trying to do in LA. And I got offered um, a, uh, a job uh, as publisher of the uh, statewide business magazine uh, up there, and uh, my ego got the better of me, and, and off I went to Minnesota. I went from Santa Monica to, to Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> and so I, yeah, so, but uh, that's why. Yeah, did but you, it led to a. It turned out to be. Did a you understand path. the weather change when you <laughs> did this? Yeah, you know, publishers aren't that smart. <laughs> I, I tell you, yeah. No, I did not. I okay. I did not. I had never felt what fifty degrees below zero felt like, and I never wanted to. And I found out anyway. You know, and you found yeah. it, and you're here now. So, what kind of guitar playing music is it? Jazz? Is it? What's your genre? So I study jazz, but that's not what I play. I'm not. I am by no means a jazz guitarist. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a songwriter, and and uh, so I just, you know. Do you sing your songs too? I do. Yeah. yeah. Or used to. Yeah. Do you have one that? You want me to just break into do a little acapella thing? Kind of pretend <laughs> I don't to think play. We're okay. Do that, all right. No. All right. All right. All right. So. <laughs> This is one of those cases where he would have the last word, so we're not going there. Okay. I'm going to, again, switch, and we're going to um, turn it open to all of you after this question. Big business town, that's Portland. Small business town, that would be Gresham. But Gresham is the fourth largest city in the state. But we do, everybody will agree, and maybe you do too, that we have a small town feel. We still have a small, and I think that's a, to our um, credit for as large as we are. So what's your opinion of our community with the stats that we have, but with the small town perception? Is that, does that hold us back um, at the table or is that a powerful tool for us? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, think, I, I think what I would, um, I think what I'd be uh, looking at is you know, so yeah, Portland's grown at what forty thousand people a year, right? And you guys are feeling the impact of that. You know, Dean and I have been going to the Pickathon Music Festival for years, right? And every year you drive out to Happy Valley, and it's a different Happy Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can see that just driving out uh, to Persimmon, and and that's not going to you know if you know. I, 
part of the economic growth, the economic success that Portland has had is hugely due to the pressures, uh, the financial and economic pressures of Seattle and San Francisco, right? I mean, companies are coming here right and left because it's cheaper and it's, and you know, when I came back, I, I'll never forget, I used to, Earl Blumenauer used to always talk about, you know, the, all these very far left sort of uh, uh, initiatives and so forth. And, and you go, what about business? He goes, if, if people like it here, they'll come here. So if, it's, if it's livable and it's a beautiful place, they'll come here. And I just go, oh my God, you know, and just, and just rage at him about that. Turns out he's right. You know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, Portland is the hottest place in, uh, uh, on the West Coast because it's the most affordable place on the West Coast and because a lot of the things that were, that were done um, when you were speaker, when, uh, when a lot of the folks that really set the stage for how the Portland region would grow um, created what I think is an amazing template about uh, that, that, that uh, in a lot of ways forces how we handle the growth that we're seeing. And, and, I, and I, you know, we just did our commercial real estate transformer awards and some of those developments are just, mm -hmm. they're not just developments, they are really mission driven developments, right? That growth is gonna keep happening and, and Gresham and Troutdale and, and uh, the entire east side is, is, going to, uh, is going to feel the effects of that. And so I think it's a matter of deciding, well, what is it? You know, you know the growth is going to come. And whether we go into a recession or not, it may slow down, but it's going to come back. And so I think it's a matter of, you know, deciding what is it we want to look like, and and looking at some of the some of the impacts, some of the things that Portland has gone through. Like, what are we struggling with now? Well, no industrial land, right? And so we have all of the all these businesses that are looking for industrial land. So you know, that's certainly something that that um, well, you know, look at Troutdale with the Amazon facility and those types of things. That's that's certainly something that those companies can be looking at and uh, on the east side. Uh, none of the artists uh, that Portland prides itself on being, you know, this this art community. No artist can afford to to have a shop and you know to have their studios in Portland. So is that an opportunity? Is that something that you want to create for uh, for 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 Gresham? You know, and so I think there's I think it's. Um, I think it will be whatever you know. You guys decide that it's going to be. You know what I mean? Well, it, it's a little prideful on my part. But when De Beers um, came, yeah. and the Wall Street Journal announced it before we knew about it, actually here it was Portland gets the Diamond Company, yeah. not Gresham yeah. gets the Diamond Company. And I get really tired personally of being called the Portland area. Yeah. I'm Gresham. Yeah. I, you know, I'm the CEO of the Gresham Chamber of Commerce, not the Portland area. Area, Gresham Chamber of Commerce, and it's. I think it's helpful if we know how to message because all the school districts that are in here are part of our area too. They're not part of Portland. How do we, how do we maintain or, that communication with folks that print the latest publisher, you know, from Craig yeah. information, so that Gresham has that clout without being sucked under from the Portland I, thing. You know, I, I guess I don't know if, I don't, I'm not sure I know how important that is, you know, that, that Gresham's zone is Gresham and not part of Portland. I mean, I think Vancouver has that same, you know, has that same sentiment. And I, and I think it's... About um, Portland? About Portland, oh. sure, yeah. And Hillsboro, you know, I mean, Hillsboro's got Intel and they still have that issue. You know, they're still Portland, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I think as companies look to look to Portland, they're just not looking at Portland. They're looking at the Portland region, obviously. Mm -hmm. De Beers is a great example. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's going to continue to happen. And in fact, there's going to be more and more pressure uh, around those types, those types of businesses to, uh, to come out to places like to further out from the, from the city core. And so then it's, I think it's about creating a, a, a community uh, around that economic effort, uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, your turn. I'm going to come down off my throne here and let you ask some questions. You don't mind asking questions that weren't on this sheet here, right? Okay. Good. I don't know anything else that was on that sheet, but you can ask. <laughs> All right. Does someone have a question? Warner, here you go. What do you view the um, role of our transportation congestion problems on the future growth of this area? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that, that's an area that's so uh, outside my pay range. Um, I, I, uh, it's getting really bad. 
and uh, and I'm I'm not sure what the uh, what the answers to that are. I mean, I, I do know that um, I think it was one of our one of our uh, uh, you know for. Portland specific, one of our city council members said something to the effect of we want to make it as miserable as possible to drive a car in, in Portland. Well, <laughs> mission accomplished, you know? Uh, but, uh, but there's been no, I, but, the, but generally speaking, the infrastructure investment, uh, we don't have any. You know, and that and that's a that is a real problem, and not just a problem for uh, for for livability, but a problem for commerce, and particularly for you know the 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 freight uh, coming up and down I five and uh, and everything else. And I you know I I just don't you know I don't ever see um, Portland being willing to really um, you know invest in. Uh, uh, in freeways and and roads, they they'll uh, uh, you know I think if we better hope that uh, alternative um, uh, modes of transportation uh, come in a hurry, you know. Because yeah. wouldn't that start with the federal government having a different priority? Because that's how we got all the light rail stuff. Because the money was available there, mm -hmm. not on new roads and and bridges. So c wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have to start yeah, at that level Yeah, it's a big piece of then? it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm not sure where that massive uh, transportation infrastructure uh, bill that uh, some however many billions that they were that they had uh, earmarked for that is. Uh, we so that's two things you don't know. Yeah. Okay. You know. All right. I told you can't you. fix the homeless, and you don't do with transportation <laughs> either, Craig. Councilor Hinton. Craig, I understand. I, I don't believe you're an economist. However, you've got your pulse, uh, your finger on the pulse of the business community, not only here but nationwide. Um, you share. You, you have a willingness to share any thoughts regarding the uh, the economy and where it's going in terms of a forecast. Uh, well, let's see. Over the last uh, six days or so, I, it's, <laughs> it would be shading me to the to the negative. But um, uh, I, you know, it's been just amazing to me that over the past two years, uh, with all of the um, local, national, and global uh, uncertainty in in politics, that business has just been heads down. And, and plowing ahead, and I just, um, you know, I, I, how long can you sustain that, right? And, and, uh, and we'll see, and, you know, and this, the, this sort of brinksmanship that keeps getting played uh, around a lot of trade issues, um, I think is, is probably making people a little bit numb to it, you know, but um, uh, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, you know, it, we were, what, 10 years out now on this economic run? So it's, you know, something's got to change. Michael and then Larry. <laughs> Great. Well, I saw the superintendent raise her hand over here, so I <clears throat> might be preempting your question. I don't know what it is. Uh, but um, I specialize in uh, single family resident homes, and I work with a lot of people that are moving into the area. And one of the number one questions they ask are schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to, to see your opinion of how important is that to businesses, uh, both already here and migrating in, looking at, at the strength of the schools. I think I know the answer. Uh, but how can, because I'm, I'm super excited about the superintendent and the growth of what we have out here. In your opinion, how could we tell our story to the business community of what we, got, what we have uh, you know, in the future? Yeah. Thank you. It's a huge issue. And, and you know, you look at um, uh, uh, well, Portland Public. You look at the the which is what which is what I'm most familiar with. My son's in Portland Public, and and I am on the steering committee for All Hands Raised, uh, which is the Portland Public Schools Foundation. Um, and it is a huge issue with business about um, uh, you know the quality of the schools and and also the quality of uh, skilled workers. Uh, and you know that's something, and, and that's really where uh, that's really where we feel it. Uh, as the business journal, uh, you know, we we have these um, CEO roundtables where we'll bring in um, eight or ten CEOs from particular industries for a private conversation, talk about the challenges of their, that they're facing, uh, what are the biggest you know obstacles in their in their industry, um, where things are headed, those types of things, and. 
and inevitably, whether it's whether it was ma particularly manufacturing, but whether it was manufacturing, technology, uh, healthcare, whatever it was, uh, the conversation would turn to skilled workforce, and or, and the lack of available skilled workforce, and it is um, it, it's something that that I think you know we're we're seeing the effects of uh, of um, a disinvestment in. in uh, uh, technical training uh, for kids in high school. We're seeing the, the effects of, uh, it drives me crazy at, at uh, my son goes to Lincoln, and Lincoln's a great school, you know, academically, but all they talk about is going to college. All they talk about, and they and the 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 um, sort of access that kids have to a, a picture of what a career looks like, a picture of what a job looks like, whether it's a job that requires a four-year education, a job that requires a two-year education, or a job that requires a high school education, they don't have one, you know, and um, and, and that has to change, and and so a Benson High School, I think, is a is a great example of of the you know the potential, but that's one school, you know, and um, so we we started. We did a series last uh, uh, the past six months uh, of this year, uh, focused on that on that very issue, the the, uh, the workforce called how Oregon works, and just looking at all these industries and looking at all the all the different uh, jobs that are within these industries, what sort of training it takes to to get there, um, the compensation, you know, the cost of that education. Uh, and and looking at pathways for um, looking at pathways for individuals who have um, gotten off the gotten off the the rails of the of the traditional education model, and it's a it's just a really it's a critical issue for us. And and so uh, you know, Lisa the Mount Hood Community College and and uh, uh, is uh, the 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 community colleges are doing a, a a great job of that, but the funding is really dismal for that. And it's stuff. going to get so. worse, according to the worse. governor's budget. Yeah, right. So Larry, then Dr. Pereira. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, your opinion, Major League Baseball, good, <laughs> good bad, indifferent? Do uh, you think it's going to happen? That will be um, uh, about three quarters of a mile up the road from my condo. And if uh, if all the stars align, the stadium in Alameda down in Oakland falls through, and the Oakland A's come up here, and I can walk to see the Oakland A's. That that Wouldn't would be. Wouldn't you see it from your from your view? You could sell seats off your patio. There you go. <laughs> We're on the lower levels. Oh. So wow. I lo I I is if it's privately funded, I'm all for it. You know. Is it going to be privately funded? Are we going to have to do something as a as a region? Yeah, probably. But um, uh, I think it'd be awesome. But that's just you know that's just me because I love baseball. So, Craig, Dr. Pereira is the superintendent of Gresham Barlow School District. Craig, hi. Um, thank you again for being here this, um, this afternoon. I, I have a question, obviously, about schools. Yeah. <laughs> I always have a question about schools. Um, nonetheless, we, this is my second year. I spent a lot of time last year listening and learning in the community. And this year, we're realigning uh, some of our curriculum and identifying uh, key performance indicators for our students. Like, we want to know what, what does the community want um, our Gresham Barlow students to, what skills they want. So from the business perspective, um, and we've met with a lot of uh, stakeholders in the area. From the business community, for the entire area, what do you believe are the most important success skills, I will call them, because I do agree with you, we focus too much on the college admissions officers checklist, and Gresham Barlow is creating pathways for our students that we actually will launch one in February with uh, Fortis and Lee Crutcher Lewis for um, uh, architecture, construction, and engineering for our students' pathways. Um, but nonetheless, what, what do you see are those uh, most successful skills that students need for the future? Yeah. So, uh, so our we, as part of that How Oregon Works series, we did a we did a couple of events with them. The last event um, we had um, a Dr. John Hunter, who's the CEO of OHSU Health Systems. We had Mike Moore, who is the uh, who runs the Amazon Troutdale facility, million square foot facility. Um, we had um, uh, from Nike, we had um, uh, Claire Hamill, who oversees all their global um, innovation and growth initiatives. And uh, we had 
one more person. I'm going to draw a blank on who that person was. Uh, anyway, I can. I think they have a much, much more valuable perspective than I do. What they talked about were uh, communication skills um, and ability to communicate and engage, um, and the ability to be a uh, to be a lifelong learner and curious, because work is changing so fast. Um, that it takes somebody who is really curious about what the next step is. There's no, you know, there's no formal training that we can give these kids that's going to prepare them for what happens three years from now. You know, um, and the other person you should you should talk to to Mike Moore is out at is is out at Amazon, and it and 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 you know. I invited him there because of the Amazon connection, but I also found out once once uh, I started looking into his background, he's also uh, was also a uh, Marine Attack Squadron commander, oh. and then and worked in the Pentagon uh, advising the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? And so we were talking before the program, and I'm going, you know, it it kind of strikes me that the military is probably one of the best training grounds for 18 year olds. 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, um, how do you, you know, what are your, what's your experience like? And he goes, well, let me put it to you this way. I walk into a hangar, and I see my $60 million attack helicopter in about 10,000 pieces around the room, and I'm looking at a 19-year-old kid who's going to put this back together, and I'm going to go fly it. And he says, so yeah, you got to have some pretty good training going on there. <laughs> and 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 so so when's the last time we brought you know that perspective to bear on on education, you know, um, and 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 workforce readiness, uh, particularly around education. But there's also, uh, and then I'll I'll get off this. But th I, this topic is is just um, I just think it is one of the most critical pieces uh, facing us that that there is. John Taponia is another person. Uh, he's a at uh, Echo Northwest. Uh, he was at he was our keynote speaker at our our summit a month ago. Oh no, kidding. Yeah. So did he did he show did he show the slide about um, when they look at um, <clears throat> career development starting in 1980 and and rolled through 2000 and like 10 or something like that the skill sets. Did he, did he have that slide? No, on we he no he didn't focus on that so, one that day. So they broke down the skill sets, and it's a and granted it's a very sort of rough uh, set, but it's uh, they broke down the skill sets between it, in in between um, science and math and social and social being communication skills, soft skills, right? And they tracked all of these uh, all of these careers going from the 1980s all the way through 2010, and they and they showed the earnings. Uh, the earnings from these from these different these different individuals, right, and grouped into these massive groups, and the top earners over that period always were both having both science and math and social. The next group down was um, social, no math. The next group was math, no social, and then the next group was neither, right. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I am really excited about, and we're going to do a program on that this year, is, uh, is sales as a career, as a pathway for, um, for a lot of individuals to find. You know, if you, if, you can, if you can communicate and engage, and you can learn the sales skills, those transfer across any industry out there, right? And they also, if you're good at it, will be one of the highest compensated individuals in that industry, regardless of industry. And there is a path from uh, a sales career always into a director level, right? And I just think it's an amazing pathway. And so we're going we're gonna to do a lot of work on that front, uh, too. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, but I'm not sure we have time for one more answer. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling the pressure. How about you? <laughs> I'll just drop the mic when you ask the question then. <laughs> so there's interesting conversations going around the nation and, and certainly locally. Um, I serve on the Home for Everyone Executive Committee and we're doing some actual exercises around um, racial equity and its impact on homelessness. And then there's questions about and conversations about white privilege and Me Too. 
Um, what are you seeing in the business community around these conversations? Are they happening? Um, kind of what's taking the temperature of the business community? Because certainly the nonprofits are having the conversations. Yeah, there's uh, there are and have been conversations going on about that. I don't know how much the conversations help, but I mean, look at what happened with Nike. Um, uh, you know, recently in Intel, uh, I mean, they, their CEO resigned over a, uh, a you know hashtag Me Too uh, issue. Uh, it is a it's a huge issue in 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 business in general. I I just don't know if anybody's got a great answer about uh, how to how to affect it. Real quick story. A uh, PC. <laughs> Uh, my, um, I was having a conversation with my sister-in-law, who's a, she's a tenured professor of economics at Carnegie Mellon, and she was doing a presentation to this huge global firm, and they're, and, and it's a professional services firm, and, and, and they are committed to, um, they're committed to making 50% of their partners women by, like, 2021 or something like that. A huge, huge firm. So it's a really audacious goal. And she starts looking through all of the, you know, all of the data and research around this company. And and uh, you know, she's talking with the CEO and he's and he's going, I just don't understand it. You know, we hire 65% of the incoming of our incoming um, individuals, I won't say what industry, of our incoming individuals uh, are women. I don't get it, and how? And we're still, you know, we still only have 10% at, at the top. And and she's going, well, that's because recruitment is your problem. You know, your problem is when these individuals get to a certain point in their career. Um, by bias, you know, by inherent bias uh, that has been that has built over decades in the company, and, and also for as a failure to accommodate uh, women in childbearing years that want that want to uh, start a family and those types of things, and and so I thought it was a really interesting, uh, you know, um, I thought it was a really illuminating sort of uh, look at at how you know easy it is to look at the wrong issue, you know, and particularly around something like that, and so. That's all I know. One bright spot over the next five years. We mentioned baseball. Okay. There <laughs> so I'm a footballer. I'm not a baseballer. Baseball never ends. It's nine innings, but it could take 15 hours. So. Yeah. I, you know, like I said, I think this area, this is the best version of this area that, that we have ever had. And, and I, li I am a big fan of the way it's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of battling over how we grow. But I think by and large, you know, we do a really good job of, uh, of adhering to a, uh, to sort of an, a, a principled ethos that has been in place uh, here for a long time, and hopefully, you know, that'll that'll just uh, that'll keep going. I say this with all sincerity. We are very grateful that you came to the luncheon today. Can you give him a round of applause, please? A Gresham round of applause. Busy time. You can shop in Gresham on your way. Uh, get a gift. There's I free parking <laughs> downtown. There's lots of it. Gift certificates to restaurants. The mayor would love it if you would do okay. that. That's uh, January. There's no uh, business and leaders luncheon, and that's because we have the business excellence awards the day before. So rather than have you come back to back, come to the business excellence awards. And Craig's going to be playing the guitar and singing for us. He's going to write a song just for that event. February, we have a great speaker, but Larry is keeping it a secret from us. In March, we have the State of the City, so we won't have a BLT that month either. They're the Chamber co-sponsors, the State of the City, and we're looking forward to that. And I want you also to be sure and pick up the replay schedule for Metro East. Once again, I want to thank our sponsors, Metro East Community Media. Thank you. Gresham Barlow School District. Dr. Barrera, thanks for coming again today and for asking that question. And Portland General Electric. Dean, as usual, thank you for letting me tease you. Portland General Electric is a great partner. We appreciate that so much. Unless there's something else that somebody needs to say, Craig, thank you again. You're dismissed. Thank you.